Hi, everybody, and welcome. I'm Judy Newton, chairperson of the Levy Senior Center Foundation. We are happy to welcome you to today's Levy Longevity Program on the caring for your aging brain, something we all appreciate. This new series is presented in conjunction with Amita Health and the City of Evanston. In these sessions, we will discuss common issues of concern for adults 55 and better. But more importantly, our mission is to come together in the spirit of life and learning to help us all age well. As always, we appreciate your support of the foundation as we continue to work to connect our community of older adults. A special thanks to Amita for embarking on this journey with us. And we are excited today to welcome Dr. Ken Grummet. Right now, I'm happy to introduce our moderator, Sam Cochran, Amita Sports Medicine Outreach Liaison, who will introduce us to Dr. Grummet. Here you go, Sam. Thanks, Judy. My name is Sam Cochran, and I am an athletic trainer by trade and the sports medicine liaison in the Chicago metro region with Amita Health. I'm going to start off by going over some housekeeping items. First, all attendees are unmuted for the duration of the presentation. Questions may be submitted using the Q&A feature in the bottom center of your screen. Please do not use the raise hand or chat feature or attempt to unmute. We will not be able to hear or see you. Next, at registration, you were able to pre-submit questions. Similar questions were grouped together and addressed in the presentation. Additional questions will be answered at the end of the presentation during the Q&A portion. Additionally, it is not permitted for this presentation to be recorded by attendees. However, it is being recorded and will be available on the Levy Foundation YouTube channel and website. Lastly, this presentation is intended for information purposes only and is not intended to replace individualized care provided by your respective doctors and or practitioners. Amita Health and the Levy Foundation are not liable for the misuse of any inf information presented today. Now, I would like to introduce you to our speaker. Today, we have Dr. Kenneth Grummet. Dr. Grummet is an internal medicine physician with Amita Health that specializes in geriatric primary care with an emphasis on brain health. He has a passion for helping people overcome their health challenges through preventative care, utilizing a team approach to medicine. Today, he will be speaking on the health of the human brain as we progress in age. Dr. Grummet, I now turn it over to you. Thank you uh, very much, Sam, and uh, welcome everybody. Good afternoon. Uh, as uh, mentioned, can I move the slides? Okay. Today, I'm going to be talking to you about aging and the human brain. I'm just going to move a couple of things here. All right. So let's first talk for a moment about aging. I mean, we all do age, and, and you probably know uh, you've, uh, you can see certain things very easily. You, you note uh, that uh, your skin changes as you get older. Uh, we certainly notice things that are, that are obvious to us, such as the first gray hair, uh, the wrinkling of the skin, those things are quite obvious, but certainly uh, all, all other tissues age, uh, some more than others uh, in our body as we get older. Uh, our own bones become at some age uh, osteopenic and in some cases osteoporotic. There are other skeletal changes with aging, such as loss of disc height. Um, the discs between our vertebrae, and, and we've got 24 of them, they, uh, they change, uh, uh, they, they lose height, they lose water, and they can lose up to about an eighth of an inch um, per disc. And if you think about that, you can lose <laughs> quite a few, uh, about three inches just from that, uh, 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 that aging alone. Our livers and our kidneys, uh, the function decreases normally. It's, it's very often not a problem, although we do have to consider uh, um, some of the things that we do, medications we take uh, with uh, uh, decreased function in liver and kidneys as we get older. Cysts form. Uh, I don't know how many of you have ever gotten an ultrasound or a CAT scan or an MRI, and, and the doctor tells you that there are cysts on the kidneys, cysts in the liver. Uh, these are seen very, very often with aging. Uh, lungs, if you've had uh, CAT scans of the lungs or x-rays, uh, 
Uh, you may have been told uh, about a nodule here or there uh, that looked benign, and those are quite common. So the question is, uh, why not the brain? Uh, you know, certainly the brain ages like, uh, like all the other organs that, that we have. And uh, today I, I'm going to be talking to you about the normal changes that occur with aging. So we're talking about mostly aging of the normal brain. Um, I, I'm not going to be talking uh, too much about dementias. Uh, that's for another lecture, and I'm more than happy to come back at another time to talk about some of those dementias, especially Alzheimer's. There is something else called MCI uh, it, that, that stands for mild cognitive impairment, and that is, uh, that is a cognitive change that's a little bit more than the normal aging change, but is not quite at the level of the dementia. Um, so what do you need to know about mild cognitive impairment? Well, the first thing is that if you've been diagnosed with it, 50% uh, of people with MCI never truly progress to dementia. Um, however, about 15% of uh, people convert to Alzheimer's dementia, specifically Alzheimer's, every two years. Uh, sometimes uh, minimal cognitive impairment is, is caused for medical reasons. Uh, medications is a common cause uh, of, uh, of these cognitive changes. Mood disorders, depression, anxiety, uh, very often can show up as mild cognitive impairment. Uh, medical conditions, uh, certain, car certain cardiac conditions, uh, such as uh, any cardiac condition that will decrease the amount of uh, flow to your brain, uh, blood flow to your brain, such as a valvular problem, serious valvular problems, um, or certain arrhythmias because they're just not pumping enough blood to the brain. Um, liver and kidney disease, especially when it gets quite severe end stage that can cause uh, uh, cognitive issues that would fall under MCI. Uh, thyroid deficiency, uh, very, 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 very common. Most people, however, uh, when they're diagnosed with a thyroid deficiency, hypothyroidism, have not quite reached the level that it's going to affect uh, uh, their, their cognitive uh, abilities. But, uh, you know, I, I certainly have seen it. I've seen people who come in and, and they score very low on cognitive tests um, and, and, the, and, and we find that they have severe hypothyroidism. So these things occur too. There are some vitamin deficiencies that are known to cause cognitive decline enough that we would call it MCI. Uh, vitamin B12 deficiency will do this. Um, the reason vitamin B12 deficiency is common uh, as one ages is because although the gastrointestinal system generally does pretty well with aging, um, a lot of times in the stomach, uh, uh, it doesn't quite produce the secretions that it did at younger ages. And in order to properly absorb vitamin B12, it needs to be combined with a certain chemical that comes out of the uh, stomach with, with the uh, very non-unusual name of intrinsic factor. So as people get older, uh, they're consuming enough B12, but they're just not able to absorb it. Uh, another not very common, but another common vitamin deficiency would be vitamin B1, and, and that would be thiamine. So these deficiencies can cause uh, um, uh, MCI. And of course, there is vascular brain issues. Uh, um, people who have, uh, have arteriosclerosis, a uh, significant amount in the brain, uh, might have a, a certain amount of deficit in their cognitive uh, abilities. It is interesting that uh, 10 to 15% of people who are diagnosed today with MCI will not have MCI a year or two from now. Usually it's because uh, one of these medical reasons has been dealt with and the problem resolved. So a diagnosis of MCI does not mean that one is automatically on the road to uh, to dementia, Alzheimer's, or other. So, and once again, today for the most part, and certainly for the first part of the talk, I'm only going to be discussing normal aging changes in the brain. So what are those changes in the brain? So what, what things do decline normally as we get older? Uh, some more in, 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 in some people and, and uh, less in others. So the three things that we see change is episodic memory, processing speed, and executive function. Those are the 
three processes that, that do decline somewhat. And we're gonna discuss this and we'll repeat this a number of times. Uh, and in the next few minutes, I'll explain exactly what these are. So the first thing I'm gonna discuss with you is episodic memory. So there are many different kinds of memory. There is what we call extrinsic or declarative memory, and it's called declarative because we declare things from our memory. And that would be the episodic memory, which I'll explain to you in a moment. And there's also semantic memory, which I'll discuss with you. Semantic memory, by the way, does not change with age. And then there's a more intrinsic, uh, implicit memory. Um, and, and these are things that are sort of deep background, so to speak. There's procedural memory, and there are two types of procedural memory. One is motor memory. So what do I mean by that? Well, I think most of you would probably guess learning how to tie your shoes or riding a bicycle. Um, and, and those are correct. Uh, but there are also things that are not so obvious to you, but, uh, uh, but they occur very, very, very early in, in age. One of the things that I always like to consider when I'm talking about uh, uh, early procedural memory is opening a door. Um, we never think about how we open a door, but if you consider the fact that when you're a young child, um, and uh, I, I don't know what age, I'm far from pediatrics, uh, but if you, you think of a young child, maybe a year, eight months, uh, 12 months, and they're in a room and the door is closed, that's their entire world. They don't know that there's anything on the other side of the door. And if they know that there's something on the other side of the door, they don't know how to find it. It's only by watching and observing that they realize that, well, they have now seen this door open and close. They realize that there are hinges on one side and there's a doorknob on the other. And eventually they learn that they can, of course, if they're big enough, they can reach that doorknob, they can pull open the door and walk into the other room. But if you think about it, there, there's nothing intrinsically obvious about that unless you actually learn it. And that would be a, a, a motor memory uh, for procedural uh, things that we learn very, very early. And then there's something called priming. Oh, I'm sorry, one more thing about procedural memory. There's also cognitive procedural memory. So for example, language, uh, we learn how to put words together. We learn how to express them. We learn some amount of grammar. Um, this usually occurs in a window of time that occurs between you know, infancy and uh, experts say anywhere from seven to nine years. So it's easy to teach a child. Well, I don't want to say it's easy to teach a child. It, it is much easier to teach a child another language uh, if you're doing it at a younger age, three years old, five years old, some people say seven or even nine years old. And that's a window of time in which that part of the brain is programmed to learn one, two, three, or even more languages. Um, as you get older, of course, if any of you have tried to learn a language in high school or beyond, you can do it. it it's, it's not that easy, though. And actually, you're using other parts of your brain to, to learn the language at that time. So again, with procedural memory, there is, is both the motor part and, and also the cognitive part, which would be the language. Uh, and then there's priming, uh, uh, something we're not going to spend a lot of time about. And what priming is, is, is a type of intrinsic learning. So for example, I'm using today, I'm going to use a lot of terms that you may not have heard uh, of before. We're going to talk about domains and episodic memory and things like that. Uh, most of the time I'm going to use those terms. Uh, I'll give it to you with an explanation. And But as time goes on, I'm not gonna have to re-explain it because you're priming yourself with that word. So by the time you hear it for the fifth or sixth time, you're gonna understand it. That's called priming. And that is one of those intrinsic or implicit memories. And, and the last type of memory uh, we're gonna talk about, which is quite important for our discussion today is working memory. And, and we're gonna get to that in a, in a minute or two. So um, I have to X something out here. Everything is still good, I hope. All right. Um, so let's first talk about episodic memory. What does that mean? Again, it's a declarative memory. So we declare something, something out of our memory. Now, episodic memory can be long-term and short-term. I know many of you right now are going to say, well, gee, I, I, I know people when they develop Alzheimer's disease, 
they lose their short-term memory, but their long-term memory is retained for many, many years. And that is true. But that is Alzheimer's disease. That's dementia. Right now, we're not talking about that. We are talking about the, the normal aging brain. And then both long-term and short-term memory is affected to a certain uh, uh, extent. So what is episodic memory? It's also memory for facts, events, something that is attached to a specific time and place. Also, these are remembered in the first person perspective. So it's how you learned about it and that's how you remember it. So as I go through some examples here, uh, the 9-11 attacks, you remember it on the basis of where I was or where you were when you learned about it. So when you think about it, you may think about what you were listening to, where you were when you first saw it on television. And that's how you remember the 9-11 attacks. Also details about a family vacation. It may have been many, many, many years ago. You could have been five years old or, or even less, but there may be one or two things that will make you remember an event. Uh, 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 it could be you know, having gone fishing with your grandfather and caught a really nice fish and that memory is still there. And you remember it on the basis of where you were, what was going on at the time. And although I'm not gonna get too psychiatric, um, your mood at the time is one of the things that will help you remember it. So um, these are, and let me go to one other. I mean, uh, I, I think we're all seniors here. And of course, uh, um, I think indelible to you uh, in your memory, of course, is the day that uh, President Kennedy was shot. I mean, I to this day, and I'm already palpitating thinking about it uh, with, with uh, you know, the emotions coming back. I remember exactly where I was, how I learned about it, how I felt. Um, these, this is clearly, uh, you know, classical for a first person perspective, and it's attached to a specific time and place. Um, one more thing about episodic memory, and this just comes out of, uh, this is not from book learning. Uh, I also feel that sometimes we have episodic memory by proxy. So it may not, the, the actual events might not be uh, your first person, but you heard it from somebody else. I'll, I'll give you the example that I always think of. Uh, I was born in 1952, so obviously it was 11 years after Pearl Harbor. But I still remember the time that my mother told me about where she was when she first learned of the Pearl Harbor attacks. And she told me she was uh, coming out of uh, the movie theater with her mother. My mom was uh, about nine years old. And they had just come out of the movie see theater seeing Sergeant York, if any of you remember that movie. And she, you know, says they got out of the theater and everybody is, is uh, you know, walking around dazed and, and she can hear Pearl Harbor attack, Japanese, and, and all of that. And I remember that not as remembering Pearl Harbor, but I'm remembering my mother's episodic. And that is like an episodic memory by proxy to me. The other type of declarative memory is, um, is semantic memory. And semantic memory, I think most of you know what semantic means, it means words. And these are memories of words, of uh, very, very basic facts, dates sometimes, some phone numbers you'll remember. And these are not tied to a personal experience. So for example, two plus two equals four. When you hear that, you know, you're, you're not thinking back to some of your computations and get ready, we're going to do computations in a minute, but you just know two plus two equals four. You don't remember who told you that, where you were when you learned that. It's, it's, not, it's not remembered in a first person perspective or, or when you first learned that. Uh, words, so vocabulary. Now, this is different than language. So we're just talking about the words themselves. And, and don't forget, you, you learn how to speak a language and then you kind of add words uh, and they go along. Well, this is part of semantic memory. And there are some facts as well. There are some facts just about simple and obvious things. So just like we talked about learning how to open a door, there are things we learn that are semantically uh, understood and remembered. So for example, birds have wings, turtles have shells, giraffes have long necks. So certain associations like that 
you don't remember, well, probably not, where you learned that a turtle has a shell or that birds have wings. So uh, these are considered part of the semantic memory system. Um, let's see if I can move this. Okay. So let's move on from episodic memory for the moment and let's talk about processing speed. So processing speed is not the ability to complete a given task, but how long it takes to do it. So one example is how long does it take to do a crossword puzzle? So when I ask patients as part of my evaluation of their cognitive abilities, I'll ask them, do you do crossword puzzles or play any particular word games, things like that? It's part of, it's part of what I usually do. Um, well, let's say they do crossword puzzles and say, yes. I said, well, how, how, is your, uh, how are you doing with those? You're still able to do them? The, and sometimes they, they feel bad and I say, oh, gee, no, I, you know, I, I still can do them. I, you, know, you know, they do the same puzzles. Uh, they're used to doing uh, you know, puzzles once a week from a particular uh, newspaper uh, or, or magazine. They can still do it and they still do just as well or better, but they'll say, you know what, I used to knock it off in 45 minutes. It takes me an hour and 10 minutes now. Well, this is what we're talking about by decreased processing speed with aging. This is normal. Uh, this, is, this is not part of dementia. What about when you walk into an elevator? You ever walk into an elevator that you're not used to, a new elevator? Um, like in the hospital, you walk into the hospital uh, and, and, and you look at the elevator and you find the floor you wanna go to and you press four and then you uh, look down and all of a sudden you see someone running for your elevator and uh, hopefully you're looking for the open door uh, button. And then you go ahead and you stare again at the panel and then you're looking up and down and where is the open door and finally you find it and you find the correct one and you press it. Well, it takes a little longer to do that when you're 70 years old than it did when you were 30 years old. So again, this is processing speed. In the brain, and, and I'm going to try not to burden you folks too much with a, a lot of anatomy, uh, but I will come back and forth to this just a little. In the brain, processing speed is a white matter function as opposed to gray matter or cortex. Gray matter is cortex. I will show you, promise, only one MRI scan. I will just show you the difference between white matter and gray matter. So this is considered a white matter function. The third thing that changes as we get older is executive function. And this is the ability to plan, coordinate tasks, execute tasks, review progress, and then readjust those plans based on progress. A lot of multitasking is required uh, or is part of executive function. So in, in fact, if you can think of a business and, and, and the top executive there, that's why he's called an executive, you know, it's what's the executive's job at, at that company? Well, he, his job is to think strategically, to look ahead towards, uh, towards long-term goals. And, and then when he establishes those goals, he has to delegate response. He has to come up with a plan and, and then he has to delegate responsibilities. Uh, uh, and then those people move on and they give the jobs to other people who work at the company. Those people who... Uh, answer the phones, who open the mail, who work in the shop, uh, uh, who clean up, and, and, and everybody has their job. And it all comes back to the executive who has planned that, then puts it into place by delegating responsibility, then monitors the progress, and makes adjustments uh, as time goes on. Uh, for example, you know, a general in, in, in a battle, for example, uh, um, you know, they make plans, they delegate responsibility, and everything works perfectly until the first shot is fired. And then they have to kind of reevaluate what's going on, monitor what's going on, and then readjust their plans. That's executive functioning. Another example would be if you decided, uh, you decided, hey, you know what, we're, we're, we seem to be coming out of COVID. All of, uh, all of my close friends have been vaccinated. We're, I'm, I'm going to have a dinner party. Um, so you, you develop your concept of a, a dinner party and then you decide, yeah, I am going to go ahead and execute that. So you, you start to make plans. You, you plan who you're going to invite, where the party is going to be, when it's going to be, what is a good time for all of the people you're thinking about, 
what foods are you going to prepare? Is it, well, first of all, is it going to be a brunch party on Sunday morning? Is it going to be a more formal dinner uh, on a Saturday night? Uh, so you'll have to then determine uh, uh, your menu. Uh, once you determine your menu, you have to decide where and how and when you're going to purchase food. You're going to have to delegate responsibility to others in your family, who's going to cook, when they're going to cook. You got to think of decor. You have to think of parking is there good parking at this hour or that hour or you live in Evanston and you have to go make sure that they're going to allow you to park on your street because it's restricted parking hey, it's a lot of things you may have to do and you're going to delegate chores and, and and this is also another example of uh, uh, another example of executive functioning so executive functioning utilizes many different brain areas but the master area is called the prefrontal cortex or PFC. Planning here activates other areas for execution. So you're, you're going to have to uh, you're going to have to develop your concept of the prefrontal cortex and then you're going to send signals to other parts of the brain to do different activities. Um, planning here in the prefrontal cortex activates these other areas for execution. Also, it'll turn on or off other brain areas. Uh, we're gonna get back to that a little bit uh, because that, that involves attention span. So if, if you wanna, for example, think about how you're gonna cook a meal, you're gonna wanna turn off some of the other things that you have to do. So for example, how are you gonna handle the parking? You know, what are you gonna do if Uncle John is gonna come and he drinks too much and he's gonna, he drives here and he drives back. So you're gonna turn those things off while you're paying attention to your menu, for example. So this is an important part of, of uh, executive functioning. And we're gonna get back to that as, as far as some of the things that are a little, a little more difficult as we get older. So it requires the ability to pay attention to some things and to suppress others. Even though the prefrontal cortex, and again, I'm using the term cortex, which is gray matter, even that, that the fact that this is cortex and gray matter, it's the white matter that connects these various gray matter areas. So when we talk about executive function, even though gray matter is very important, so, so is white matter. One of the most important tasks that require executive functioning is called working memory. I mentioned that before. And I'm gonna give you an example now. So I'm gonna ask, I told you I have to ask you to do a little math and I'm gonna ask you, please don't write this down. But executive function, working memory is the utilization and ability to store information, update it, and then retrieve it at a later time. These are gonna be short term. Okay, you're gonna do this subtraction tomorrow and later tonight, you don't really care about this. So this is a short-term working memory. So for example, do the following problem and do it in your head. And for now, and I'll come back to it though, I'm gonna ask you if you're kind of a little bit sharp with this kind of thing, you may do it in your head and say, I'm gonna take the shortcut and say, hmm, 46 minus 28, well, 28 is almost 30. And if I subtract 30 from 46, that's 16. That's easy, okay? Uh, and then you'll say it's 16, but wait, I had to, uh, what about the other two? I'm gonna add the two on. So 16 plus two is 18, so I get 18. I'm gonna ask you for right now, don't do that. So if we're doing this, uh, what we're first doing is we're gonna isolate the ones columns and we're gonna subtract eight from six. But guess what? You can't. Eight is too much. So what do we do? We, we do know that we're gonna borrow a one from the tens column to make it 16 minus eight, and we can do that. And we get an answer of eight. We're now gonna store the eight back at a, a portion of our working memory. All right, that's our partial answer. And now we're gonna retrieve the tens column, four minus two, but now you're remembering, okay, you're retrieving this, that you had to update the one that was borrowed from the four before, okay, from the tens column. So instead of four minus two, we now have three minus two. And of course, the answer is one. Now you have to put together the one from the tens column and the eight, which you've retrieved from your working memory to give the answer of 18. Now you're probably gonna say, this is a little too hard. Why don't I take the shortcut? Well, guess what? Even when you did the shortcut of 46 minus, let's make it 30 
to get 16 and add the two, okay? You've actually did the computation of, we'll go from 28 to 30 and I'll have to put the two away and bring it back later. So that's how we say 46 minus 30 is 16, but we gotta go retrieve that two and add it. So um, I hope this kind of, I think this is a great explanation of what working memory is. And once again, working memory declines as we get older because you use executive functioning to make working memory right. It requires the proper functioning of executive function. One more little thing is something called working memory capacity. It's not very important, but working memory capacity is working memory plus attention. And it's this attention a portion that allows you to do multitasking. That's just a little uh, aside that's not terribly important. So I'm gonna go over in this portion of the talk, I'm only gonna go over one uh, piece of academic work. Later, we're gonna go to a lot of different uh, uh, experiments and, and things like that. But what I'm gonna go through here is a study done by Denise Park in the year 2000, it's not that long ago. And she did a cross-sectional study and cross-sectional means she took 350 people over a, a long age range from 20 to 92. And what she did is she tested them for many, many different types of cognitive functions. And she found an age-related decline in what we're talking about, episodic memory, processing speed, and executive memory. And the executive memory test was working memory, okay? Semantic memory did not decline. And in fact, it actually improved with age. Implicit memory, including procedural memory, such as tying your shoelace, et cetera, words, things like that, uh, they did not decline either. Um, so here is a, uh, here's a graph of what she found, and this comes from her work. And on this axis here, the x-axis, we have age. So these are 20-year-olds, 30-year-olds, 40-year-olds, all the way on up to 80-year-olds, okay? And this is just ability. Okay, this is the cognitive ability. And they tested working memory, also, also meaning executive function. They tested episodic memory, but they divided into two different tests, one short-term memory, one long-term memory. They tested speed of processing and then verbal knowledge, meaning really semantic ability, okay? So if we take a look at this group of four lines, which are episodic memory, processing speed, and executive function, working memory, we see them decline rather linear, linearly, okay? So you see them decline from age 20 to 30 to 40 and on to 80. Semantic memory, however, verbal knowledge actually goes up and up and up does look like it takes a slight decline in the 70s, but still, even at 80 years old, guess what? You, you know more than a 20-year-old, okay? Now, again, this is cross-sectional. Uh, it, it, they didn't follow someone 20 years old on into their 80s. It's kind of a difficult uh, uh, test to do, um, and, and it shows what it shows. And, and you could say that there are things that, that uh, you know, well, you know, 20-year-olds today, you know, or... 80 year olds today when we were, I'm not 80, but when we were 20 years old, uh, life was different. Uh, we lived a different life. We had different experiences. Um, you know, let's say most of us, you know, graduated high school and, and that was about as far as we went for more college grads, um, smoking, eating. We were different now than we were, but Nevertheless, this seems to show a very consistent pattern. And I'm not going to go into the other studies, but there have been studies that have that, that have looked at people at maybe over a five-year period. And if you put people in in a five-year period, you actually still find them fall pretty much on the same line. So this was a, a very, very uh, excellent study. And a lot of what we know today is uh, uh, due to this. So in summary for this part of the lecture, I'm going to remind you again, remember this is priming, right? So I'm going to remind you again that declines in cognition with normal aging is normal, and they are in episodic memory, speed of processing, and executive functioning. Not changed with age are semantic memory, 
and implicit, mostly procedural memory, as well as priming, as we're doing right now. And these things do not change with age. We're not going to really be talking today about dementias, but I, I want to explain to you that all of these declines that I've been talking to you are minimal declines, and they are not at the level seen in the dementias. So um, it, it's not that what you're finding is 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 uh, noticeable as uh, somebody's memory who has, for example, uh, um, early dementia. So let's move on to the next part. This is going to be very quick, and I promised I wouldn't do too much anatomy, but I just wanted to show you a little bit. Uh, so there are anatomical changes with aging, and I'm going to show you or tell you that they do correlate with what we've already shown with episodic memory processing speed and working memory or executive function. So we talked about cortex and I'm going to show you what cortex is in a minute. Cortex is the gray matter and there's generally less cortex as people age, although some areas do shrink more than others. So if any of you at, a, at an age in your 60s, 70s or 80s have had a CAT scan or an MRI scan, there are certain changes that are normal at, at that age. Uh, you, you may have had them, you may have been told about that. And this is not a whole lot different than when I have a patient with back pain and I get a set of x-rays. I'm, I'm actually getting those back x-rays really to look for things like uh, uh, infection or fractures uh, uh, or, or cancer in the bone uh, because we're going to see a lot of things that we always see in people who are 60s and 70s and 80s and we're going to see certain arthritic changes we're going to see the shortened disc height uh, which we talked about before um, and, and uh, maybe some osteopenia these are seen in almost every person and and that's usually not the cause of their back pain and that's not why i'm getting but again there are certain changes that we see normally as we age just like as we talked about the skin skin gets old wrinkly the hair turns gray or you lose it or these are normal so promise this will be the only one i show you and i will tell you uh, i have to apologize that when i show you the gray matter which i'm doing right now i hope you can all see my cursor here uh, the gray matter looks white and the white matter looks gray. Uh, it's just because it's an x-ray, it happens to be reversed. So what I'm going to show you now, if I want you to look at this outer portion, and you may even see what I'm highlighting here for you uh, is cortex. Cortex means the outside. Uh, and you could think of it almost like the bark of a tree. So all of this stuff here that looks lighter, this is gray, this is cortex and this is gray matter. Okay, now most of the darker areas here, paradoxically, is actually white matter. And uh, it, it's not every single part of what's inside because there are some other, it, there are other structures, there's putamen and caudate, things like that. But most all of the darker stuff is actually white matter. And it kind of makes sense because if you look at cortex, we talked about cortex, let's say prefrontal, this is almost the prefrontal area, and it wants to send a signal to uh, where you, uh, where you're talking. So it would send it, that message via the white matter. So that's, that's almost like the wire, so to speak. And I won't go into the reasons why they look like that, but um, so that's, promise that's the last MRI we're going to see. So let's, as I said before, there are some areas that, that seem to uh, get smaller more than other areas uh, of, of the cortex. And we're going to talk about those right now. So I, I don't know how many of you have heard of the hippocampus. It's actually a very, very, very small part of the brain. Uh, you've got one on the right and one on the left. It's deep inside. And the hippocampus decreases in size as you get older. The hippocampus is responsible for episodic memory, and especially short-term, but long-term as well. And it decreases in size by 30% by the time you reach the age of 80, okay? So a smaller hippocampus, um, that kind of makes sense when we talk about episodic memory. And in this case, shrinkage actually goes along with function. What about the prefrontal cortex? We talked about that before. We talked about this as the master part of the brain for executive functioning. It's responsible for many, not just executive functioning, but the prefrontal and frontal cortex 
is responsible for a lot of more complex thoughts, especially executive functioning. And this decreases uh, in size by as much as 50% by age 80. White matter doesn't as much decrease in size as there are two things which I, I'm not gonna go into it. I think it's a little too much, but uh, there are things we can see on MRI and there are other special um, types of, of scanning, which is really almost a research type of a scan. And it shows us that um, th there's a decrease in processing speed and the actual white matter decreases in integrity. And, and that's the special scan will show that, that the integrity of the white matter is not as good. And we also see small dots, we call them hyper intensities. The more hyper intensities, the worse the functioning of the white matter. So I, I think at some other time in the lecture, I'll talk about white matter hypertense intensities. Um, so we, we can, and we very much do see these on a simple MRIs and CAT scans as well. We're gonna talk for a moment about functional MRI, as opposed to an MRI as being just the picture of the anatomy, but the function, a functional MRI can tell us where the brain is thinking. For example, if you play music while doing a functional MRI scan, the music area of the brain lights up. If you show someone pictures of faces, there is a spot in your brain, that's the faces part, the cortex, that, that, uh, uh, where, you, where you look at faces and you remember faces. This area will light up. If you sh show someone pictures of places, you'll have a place in your brain where where it recognizes different places. And these are separate. Now I'll talk, this, there is some importance because in a human brain, faces and places are very, very significant. These are large areas. I don't know if any of you remember the homunculus with the big thumb and things like that for the motor part. Well, at any rate, these are major parts of, of the cortex, faces and places. So what are some of the associated functional changes with aging? Well. Brain areas that are specific for certain tasks are less specific with aging. So, for example, if a brain area that's recognizing places is different than the areas that recognizes faces, as we just mentioned, but there's less specificity with aging. So, for example, a younger person that has been told, we want you to look at all of these pictures of faces, okay, and only faces. If we did the functional area, we would see that the faces part of the brain will light up and the places will be suppressed, okay? And vice versa, when you show that person pictures of places. Well, it turns out that as you get older, there isn't that much specificity. So when you're showing faces, the places part of the brain will also light up a little bit. Um, and, and, I, and I'll kind of get back to why this, there's some importance to that in, in just a moment. So how do we overcome some of the deficits? So uh, there is good news. And some of the good news is that, um, that, that we can overcome uh, some of these things that occur with aging. Some of the ways in which we overcome our natural brain compensations, they occur without you thinking about it. Some of it are conscious strategies that I'm going to talk to you about it. And then finally, we're going to end our discussion with lifestyle interventions that definitely help overcome cognitive deficits with aging. So we, we already went through the bad news. And for now for, and for, we're going to go to the good news. So let's first talk about those natural compensations. These are unconscious, we don't think about it. Um, and, and by the way, in the body, the human body, uh, we compensate in other areas as well. We compensate in, our, in the way we walk. Um, we, we walk differently when we get older. Sometimes well, part of the way we walk is to compensate for other deficits. Um, another thing that happens, uh, I'll go into something called collateral circulation. So if you have a blockage in a certain artery, maybe in the heart, if it's a slowly developing blockage, sometimes some of the vessels, arteries that go around there, they will get bigger and they will pick up some of the slack for the blocked artery, okay? Uh, this, is, it, it, this is when you have a chronically slowly developing blockage. Well, there are these similar natural compensations. I, I won't go into too much, but I, I will tell you, for example, we use both sides of the brain more as we get older. So whereas an activity such as looking at faces or places, 
have involved a location on the right side of the brain when you're younger, the brain will now recruit cortex, the similar place on the left side to kind of help out, all right? There's also a general shift in brain activity from the back for certain things to the front. And so you're using the front as well as the back, just like you'll use the right side as well as the left. These are things we don't think about, but when we're able to do functional MRIs, we find that it's different between the young and, and the older people. And we think of that as, as a natural compensation. Number two, we'll talk about conscious strategies. And I think these things are quite fun. So you've all heard, so what are some of the strategies we can do to help our, our memory, for example? So you've all heard about one picture is worth a thousand words. I, I'm going to go over a, a, a little experiment here, which I think is fascinating. Let's talk about vision. So I, I actually looked this up. And by the way, I have a master's in evolutionary biology, so I enjoyed this one. And I decided that the eye really started to develop uh, in, in, in animals about 440 million years ago. That's a long time. Language developed hundred thousand years ago, give or take, there's some people say as much as 150, some people say 70, but let's let's just use a hundred thousand. And let me give you a perspective on these times. So if 400, let, let's put this into it one day. So if 440 million years was 24 hours, what is a hundred thousand years? Well, that's about 21 seconds. So if, if we've had we as as animals have had the evolution of the eye for 24 hours we only picked up language about 21 seconds ago so what is that telling you about evolution of the eye it, it shows that it's more important to see than to speak and that does make sense because it's more important to see that there is a predator chasing you or if you're looking for food if you're the predator you want to see what's what's running away from you so seeing is more important than speaking. So you would therefore think that the visual cortex of the brain is more dominant. So let's go into this amazing study. So this was study done at Harvard a while back. And what they did was they showed 600 pictures of things. And I just, a spoon, a chair, a mountain, a schoolhouse, and 596 other things. They showed them these pictures for six seconds each. Then when they're all done, they showed them a pair of things. So they showed them two spoons, the spoon that they saw before and a different spoon, the mountain they saw before and a different mountain. And then they said, which one did you see previously? So I'm just gonna give you an example if you haven't been able to follow this. So we'll show you this picture of a chair. If you look at it for six seconds, then we'll go to the next picture. And that would be a spoon. And you'll look at this for six seconds. And then we'll keep doing this and we'll do it and do it and do it for 600 pictures. Then we're gonna give you a pair. We're gonna say, which chair did you see before? Okay, and hope you picked out the right one. Which spoon did you see before? All right, and you do this for the 600 different items. So shockingly, the correct response was given 98% of the time. I mean, I, I, when I, I, I think this is a really a fascinating uh, uh, study. And I'll go one further. This, was, this study was repeated not with 600 items, but it was repeated with 10,000 items. And they showed it to them not for six seconds each, but for five seconds each. By the way, it took more than one day and then a week later, they were asked to do the same sort of thing. They were shown pairs and asked which one they had seen before. They actually got the, the correct answer 83% of the time. So what's the conclusion? The conclusion is use visual imagery to aid memory. So for example, for this lecture, hopefully being able to see is a little bit better than just listening to me. Another conscious strategy is to connect information to something you know, and that is something interesting. <clears throat> and this is up to you. You actually have to work to do this. And, and this is, by the way, how professional memory experts, people who go to uh, uh, contests on memory, this is how they do things. So really, it's be as silly as you can if it helps. It doesn't have to be 
It doesn't have to be serious. You can be as silly as one. For example, if you just met Harry at a party and you noted that, gee, I have to remember Harry's name. He has a full set of hair with a mustache and a beard. So you might think of Harry the Harry. So the next time you see him in the mustache and the beard, you'll remember his name is Harry. Or if you met William at the same party and he's broad and muscular, you might think of Bill the Bull. So this again is another strategy, a conscious strategy that you can use to help your memory. Um, another thing is to test yourself. So you're learning something. And in the past, for example, it could be something like a phone number. You probably remember when you were younger, you learned something and you'll repeat it over and over and over. So you learn, you learn an address. It's uh, 564. 564 Main Street. You'll say it over again, 564 Main Street. I hope none of you live at 564 Main Street. 564 Main Street. Just say it over and over and over. And this was going to be the way you remember it. A few years later, we were saying, well, let's not do it that way. Let's say it 564 Main Street and let's wait a few minutes, then do it again, 564 Main Street. Okay. Then maybe do it two, three, four times, and that will help your memory. Well, guess what? There's been research recently, which I think is surprising. And what that research is, is to test yourself, especially in writing, okay? So this study was from Washington University in St. Louis. One group was, a group of students were asked to read a short chapter for five minutes, which is like a two page chapter. And then they were allowed to read it again three more times for a total of 20 minutes. So they read the same chapter for 20 minutes, four times. The second group was asked to read that same chapter for five minutes once, and then they closed the book, and then they were asked immediately to write down on paper what they remember. The paper was then discarded. They did not have the opportunity to go and take their paper and go back to the article and read it and check it off, and this was right, this was wrong. So the paper was discarded, and then uh, five minutes later, th they did it again, and five minutes later, so they, they tested themselves three times, but they were never able to go back to the original article. So a week later, they were tested just like a regular, you know, a regular uh, uh, a test in school. They were tested on the chapter. And surprisingly, when they were given the same test on the material, the first group who read the chapter four times got it only 40% correct. The second group who tested themselves scored 60%. So uh, I, I have given this lecture a number of times to a lot of uh, students, residents, other doctors, and uh, they have kind of adopted this and, and they, they have told me that they feel that it does help. So it, it's very interesting. And once again, this is number two, conscious strategies. This is something that we can do ourselves. So you go to that party, you, you learn people's names. You know what, you may go out later and on a piece of paper, start to write down whatever you remember. The third thing is, lifestyle interventions. Um, and this is going to take the rest of our lecture. And uh, I, I, I want to just let you know here that in the first part of the lecture, we were talking about uh, uh, normal aging changes in, in, in people who do not have dementia or even minimal mild cognitive impairment. Um, the studies we have are good. They're not great because it's difficult to do when you're talking about lifestyle. If I want to give you a medicine and as an experiment, and then I, I, uh, I give you a cholesterol medicine, and four weeks later, I check your cholesterol. As long as you took the medicine, okay, it's a great study and easy to, 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 to do. But when we talk about lifestyle interventions, such as the things we're going to talk about, we talk about stress and exercise and especially diet, it's not easy to do these studies because not everybody is perfect with, uh, with their performance and it's not like taking the pill every day, okay? So what I am going to do here is a lot of these studies now are not going to be uh, considering just normal aging changes like episodic memory and processing and working memory. But a lot of these studies also did general uh, uh, cardiovascular health, survivorship, mortality as some of their endpoints. And some of them used dementia and the delay or prevention of, of, of producing dementia. So I'm going to be mixing and matching, not because that's my intention, but because that's what these studies show. So 
I'm going to, we're first going to look at something that you may have heard of the blue zones. I know a lot of you have. So there was a National Geographic project, I, I think about 20, 25 years ago. Uh, uh, the, the man who, uh, who started this was Dan Buettner. And what they did was they looked at populations all around the world, and they especially found populations where people lived long and healthy and very much cognitively intact lives. They were also, as I said, they're found to maintain excellent cognition with their aging. And some of these blue zones were a, a particular, not, not all of Sardinia, but a particular community in Sardinia. Uh, most of El Okinawan women, not the men. There's a small a community in Costa Rica. There is a particular Greek Mediterranean island. I forget the name of it. Uh, and and if, if you're starting to put two and two together and you say, well, hey, hey you're probably talking about, uh, you're probably talking about uh, genetics here because, you know, these people have lived in this small community all their life and, and they all have the same genes. Well, there's also a Seventh-day Adventist community in California where people come from wherever they come from. There, there's certainly nothing you could say where they all probably share the same genes. And so there's also that Seventh-day Adventist community in California. So what do we observe about their lifestyles? Well, one is that they're very physically active. They eat simple diets, local food, and often homegrown food. These foods are especially high in fruits and, and vegetables. The portions are very modest as well. They also, lead, uh, they also lead a very highly social life, and they live in a society where elders are respected and given a participatory role in the community. Uh, they interact with, with others as leaders. Uh, they interact with uh, many generations of, of children and grandchildren and great-grandchildren, and they lead a low-stress lifestyle. It's not to say that there aren't stresses in their life, but they, they, they live it in, in a way that we in the Western society very often don't. Uh, I just couldn't, uh, I had to put this in. This was a picture I took uh, in a small fishing village uh, off of the Bosphorus in, in, uh, in Turkey. And, and I saw uh, this man here walking down or walking up the road, he's walking uphill. And then I saw him just walk into a little enclave where uh, obviously a friend of his was mending his fishing nets. And there was another buddy there and he just just kind of sat down and, you know, and, and he was offered, uh, uh, actually he, he did, the, it wasn't even offered. He just went and grabbed a, a cup of tea. And I, when I saw this, uh, th that was my thought of uh, one of these blue zones, not a blue zone, uh, and, and you know, certain a low stress a life uh, and uh, being respected as elders. Uh, one of my residents say, hey, what about this guy? He's smoking. I, I had not seen that. Uh, but otherwise, uh, uh, th that was just one thing that I thought of when I, I saw this, uh, when I was going to do this lecture, I put this picture up. So what are the things, what are the lifestyle interventions that, that we can adopt? Uh, and, and I've listed them here uh, kind of by what's most important in, in my estimation, but more so in terms of the actual studies, which studies are strong studies that show really overwhelming evidence? And I, and I rank them from one to five here. Physical activity showing strong, robust clinical evidence. Then the diet for which uh, it's been determined that there's moderate clinical evidence. Cognitive interventions, which also shows moderate evidence. Socializations, it, the, the evidence is not quite clear. It's very difficult to measure socialization. And then, uh, but I do have a few studies. Uh, they're mainly observational. And then a low stress lifestyle. So let's start to go into them. So let's talk about physical activity. I'm gonna talk to you about some observational studies first. So this was the Harvard Nurses Study and it started a long time ago. And they started out with 20,000 older nurses in, in the Boston area. And they followed them over the years. Uh, mainly with phone call uh, uh, um, uh, uh, conferences with them. And what they did is they kind of divided them into a few categories. Those nurses who, who had a lot of uh, physical activity in their life, uh, a, a lot of exercise, those with moderate, those with mild, and, and those that were strictly sedentary. And they found that there's a real positive correlation between those nurses who showed a higher level of physical activity and a higher cognition level. Um, a similar study done with 4,000 older adults that did not have dementia. They started out, started out with normal cognition. That's important here. 
and, and this was a Canadian study. And, and they found similarly that those who are most physically active here, again, the endpoint wasn't their cognitive abilities as, uh, I, mean, I mean, there was, but they also looked at the development of Alzheimer's disease. And they found that the most physically active subjects had 40% less cognitive impairment as well as 50% less development of Alzheimer's disease. And even older adults that participated in a low level of phys physical activity as opposed to sedentary, they also showed cognitive uh, uh, benefit and had 33% less Alzheimer's disease. There were some rat experiments uh, in here. So those were kind of observational studies. This is, uh, uh, this is a little easier to do. These were rat experiments and they were done by Fred Gage in the 1990s. And these, were, uh, uh, th these, these made a huge impact in what we learned about neurology. And they he found that those rats that were exercised on a regular basis, as opposed to the controls, these rats actually grew new hippocampal cells. So at the end of their life, when they were uh, uh, autopsy, they've actually found growth of new hippocampal cells. Now, why was this uh, so important? Because until his study done, it was it was accepted in biology that you can't grow new nerve cells of any kind once you get to adult, adulthood. So we found that this was wrong. More recent studies, similar studies show that not only were there new cells, but there was increased brain blood vessels in the hippocampus. And also other studies show that there were more levels of what we call growth hormones, uh, presumably the secreted, uh, you know, uh, from the blood vessels of these, of these hippocampus. So there's a lot of stuff that went on here, which uh, and their conclusion, of course, is that exercise does allow you to grow more hip and improve your memory in that respect. A, a, a human study was done at the University of Illinois. A lot of studies, by the way, were done at the University of Illinois Champaign. Um, um, they, they have been one of the leaders in, in this sort of a neurobiology. And so they took 120 older adults. 60 of them were given aerobic exercises to do for a year. And 60 controls were just given uh, stretching, toning, and weightlifting. I know it's surprising. Everybody thinks that this is as important as aerobic. It's important, but so they were just, these are the controls, stretch, tone, and do some weightlifting. And at one year, the aerobic exercise group did better in two things. When they did MRIs, they found that their hippocampus volume improved from the from the MRI they did when the study started. And there was also improvement in memory, episodic memory. And you would kind of expect these two things to be correlated. So the recommendation is to participate in moderate levels of aerobic exercise. We always tell people to start low and go slow. This is a mantra for geriatricians. You're starting a medication, start with a low dose and go slow and build it up. And obviously we don't want anybody to go out and hurt themselves. And, and in fact, in this study, they started them doing 10 minutes of very easy, uh, very easy treadmill and worked it up over the year. Also a, a kind of a goal for kind of what you would maximally want to do as far as exercise is a moderate level of aerobic exercise for 150 minutes a week. I, I won't go into what that means, it, but it's probably, if you're, gonna, if you're gonna be on a treadmill, it might be three and a half miles an hour with a little bit of elevation, maybe four degrees. Uh, and that would be something you might wanna work up to and, and, and do 150 minutes a week, uh, you know, broken into, you know, 50 minutes, three times a week or 30 minutes, five times a week. Let's talk now about diet. And unfortunately, I'm sorry, but the top part of my screen is gone. Oh, so observations are that people in longer lived communities, such as those blue zones, eat less total calories. They let eat less rich and sugary processed foods and smaller portions. Many of these people eat a Mediterranean type diet. Mediterranean diet is high in fruits, vegetables, olive oil, nuts, and most specifically, they're low in saturated, fatty, and sugary foods such as red meats and processed carbohydrate uh, foods. So 
one study that was done, again, observational, it was called the Seven Country Study. It started right after World War II. They looked at more than 10,000 men eating a Mediterranean diet. They found that they had less heart disease and lived longer. The older men uh, uh, in the study were found to also have less cognitive decline. Again, this is just observational. It doesn't say that this is the cause of it, but uh, it, it leads, of course, to other studies. It's also noted in this study that as time went on and a lot of these men uh, may have moved elsewhere into big cities or they moved to, uh, to uh, more Western countries, um, that these advantages disappeared if they changed to a more Western style diet and, and lifestyle. Uh, there was another study, uh, not the Predomed, there's also a, a study called the Lyon study where they're actually now doing experiments with controls. And in the Lyon studies, they were looking at uh, cardiovascular uh, uh, health and mortality. So they took 300 men who had, uh, had heart attack uh, who were told to eat a Mediterranean style diet and 300 people as controls. They were told to eat a diet, uh, just a general say, go out there and uh, you know, cut down on your fats, some little advice and, and sugars. And they, th this study was supposed to run for five years, but it was so overwhelming at a little over two years that the, those that are eating Mediterranean diet lived so much uh, the, their mortality was so much better than those that didn't, that they stopped the study and, and uh, uh, came to the conclusion that the Mediterranean diet really helped save lives uh, after a heart attack. So the big study done was the Predimed study, and, and this was done and published, I think, in 20, about 2014, 2015. And, and they looked at, uh, uh, they took many different multiple uh, many different Mediterranean sites, uh, especially in Spain and Italy. They had more than 7,000 subjects. These people were randomly assigned to th eat uh, into three groups of diet. The first group ate a Mediterranean, Mediterranean diet rich in extra olive oil. The second group ate the Mediterranean diet rich in nuts. And the third just ate at a standard low fat. They're just told to eat a low fat diet and nothing else. Well, guess what? This study was also stopped early for the same reason, because of the improvement in mortality and heart disease. So in, in both uh, the first and the second group eating a Mediterranean diet, they did so much better that they said, we have to stop this early because we have to let people know that, that your, your controls have to start eating better. Um, there was in this study a secondary outcome, which was cognition, and they tested many different uh, domains. Remember, we talked about domains. A domain is, is a particular activity such as, well, let's say executive function, episodic memory. You know, all these are different. These are called domains. So uh, they improved in several different domains. I'm going to show you here a bar graph. So here we have the memory testing, the frontal cognition, which included executive function, and just overall cognitive. <clears throat> these are the controls. The darkest are the controls, and these two are the two Mediterranean diets, okay? Uh, one, of course, with uh, extra uh, olive oil, the other with nuts. And as you see, clearly, the people in the Mediterranean diet actually improved in, in, in their scores, whereas the control did much worse and considerably less worse. As to which is better, the olive oil or the nuts, uh, you know, I, the conclusion has generally been not from the cognitive study, but from the general mortality and cardiovascular uh, benefits that probably the olive oil is a little bit better, but, you know, just Mediterranean diet alone is good. Uh, there are other diets. There's the, the famous DASH diet. Uh, I see we're running kind of a little low, so I'm going to speed up and cut down on some of the studies. Uh, there was the DASH diet, which is dietary approach to stop systolic hypertension, and then something called the MIND diet, uh, which we're testing. These also showed improved cognition. Uh, I, I, I'm going to just, as I said, cut back a little. The DASH diet showed, uh, uh, even though this was to show an increase in, uh, in blood pressure, they also looked at se secondary, secondary studies looked at cognition and found that cognition improved as well. And if they added physical exercise, 
they did even better. Uh, this was a Duke study that added uh, an improved DASH diet with exercise and, and their cognition was even better. The MIND diet is, is actually a Chicago diet from Rush. They developed it. It's kind of a hybrid between the DASH and the Mediterranean. It's very high in specific green leafy, specific green leafy vegetables, kale, spinach, collard greens, and three others, and berries. They're big on berries, especially blueberries. And it's, these are foods that they say are high in vitamins A and C. Their claim is that it's, uh, is, is that it's uh, um, um, the, the antioxidant effect that helps the most, uh, that may or may not be true, but that's what led to this diet. And again, they show decreased, a decreased incident in developing Alzheimer's disease. It was actually those people that followed the MIND diet very, very carefully actually had 50% less Alzheimer's disease. And those patients that maybe had moderate adherence, even they showed a reduction in Alzheimer's disease development by, it was 35% as opposed to the 50%. Let's go into cognitive training then. I want you to read this out. Uh, cognitive training that specifically targets individual domains. Remember that would be brain function areas such as executive function, episodic memory, processing, speed reasoning, can slow down the decline in that given domain and may last long beyond the conclusion of the training. Narrowly focused activities, and I know a lot of you had questions about this, narrowly focused activities such as many computer games marketed as enhancing memory and decreasing the risk of dementia help only in that activity, not the entire domain, but just in that activity. For example, crossword puzzles. I know a lot of you think that uh, uh, this is very, very helpful, and I love crossword puzzles, so I, I don't want to put them down, but the doing daily crossword puzzles helps you only in doing crossword puzzle. And by the way, if you remember, this is semantic memory. It's not one of the domains that declines with age. So you do better crossword puzzles, but you're, you're not helping anything else. The Institute of Medicine established guidelines to evaluate the benefits of cognitive training products. So all of these products that are hawked out uh, on computer and get this game, this will help prevent Alzheimer's, this will help improve your cognition. So they came up with five statements. One is that when you look, a study should have an active control group. So for example, the control group is not somebody who's doing nothing, but they have to be doing something. So if you remember when we, for example, uh, with exercise, I talked about one was doing aerobic exercise, the other was doing uh, stretching and toning. So that would be considered an active control. The benefits of, of doing this particular uh, uh, um, game, so to speak, transfers to other tasks in the same domain. So if you're doing one thing in the domain, they'll be able to to improve at processing speed or executive functions. The benefits resulted in improved real world tasks. And I'll show you one example of that. The trained skills have to last long. They, they don't like go away in three weeks. And that the studies that, that these people who hawk brain games, um, these studies have to be repli replicated by research groups uh, other than the original ones and specifically groups that are not trying to sell the product. And, and these were considered what's necessary in order to be considered something valid. <clears throat> so I, I'm just gonna go through with this one study. So this was done in 2014, actually by, done by Denise Park, who we talked about before. And her experimental group had what they call productive engagement. And these people were given courses in uh, three groups. One was given photography, one quilting, and the third one got half quilting and half photography. The control group were what they call receptive engagement. They, just, they were told to listen to music, to do crossword puzzles, Sudoku, uh, jigsaw puzzles. So this was the control group. And the experimental group showed improvement in not, not just in photography and quilting, but in all of episodic memory. So they took general episodic memory tests, and that's the domain here, and they found that the improvement helped not just in photography and quilting, but also in episodic memory. Um, for the purpose of time, I won't go into some of these others. Um, um, one thing, there's something called useful field of vision and people are, it, it is kind of a, a computer game. They're focused on one thing in the middle and they, they are gradually shown things outside of what their task is in the middle. And as time goes on, week after week, they expand it out. 
Um, and, and this is to help them with multitasking. And they did indeed show that there was improved cognition, not just in the ability to do this particular uh, um, uh, um, exercise, but in general executive function. They, they tested them on working memory and found that these people did better in working memory. And what we're talking about with real life benefits, fewer car accidents. Uh, and that's something that they did publish. The recommendation in general is don't look so much for games and such, but the one thing that you, you need to look for is, for example, take a course. It doesn't have to be an academic course like uh, uh, American History 202, unless that's what you want to do. Uh, they can be in, in other things. It can be in, in learning a language. You want to engage multiple brain domains. And don't forget, if you're taking a course, uh, learning a second language, uh, things like that, if you take it to school, it has benefits beyond just doing that, you're socializing with other people, uh, hopefully after COVID, we're doing that more and, and that you're doing a certain amount of getting there. There's a certain amount of physical activity. Uh, I'm gonna go over socialization really quickly. I'm only gonna go over the, I have a few studies, just go over this one. Uh, in, uh, uh, so this was another University of Illinois study. They took two groups, um, the same number of people, but in group number one, they, they took groups of pods of six to eight people, older adults, they were all older people. Group two, uh, the same number of total people, but they work individually at home. And, and they were given, uh, uh, they were asked over six months to work on certain projects. They were given the same projects. Uh, they tested them in six domains, including the ones that we know, processing, speed, working, memory, and reasoning, which is another frontal after six months, and they found the socialized groups, the ones that worked in groups together, improved in all six areas and exceeded the results of the solitary individuals. So they not only got better, but they exceeded uh, um, the ones who worked individually. Uh, the, uh, the suggestion is that socialization was helpful. Uh, we, we don't have time to go into these studies. I wanna talk a little bit about stress. Uh, studies are very limited. They're, difficult to do in large group trials. Many of the studies with humans are observational only. Most studies are in animal models or at a cellular level. And by the way, as a physician uh, or, or you know, telling someone else, a loved one, just telling someone, you know, you gotta, you gotta lower your stress level. It's very easy to say, very difficult to do. Uh, what are possible interventions? Increasing physical activity actually does help limit stress. Increase socialization limits stress. There are other things like meditation, yoga. Uh, I hope some of you have heard of mindfulness. Uh, these are these uh, are known to decrease the stress. Uh, I won't go too much into uh, some of the chemistry uh, and anatomy of stress. Uh, let me just say, stress uh, uh, is a lot of it occurs in flight, fight or flight situations, and there's release of adrenaline and glucocorticoids also known as steroids, but I'm not talking about growth steroids. We're not talking about you know, steroids used to Im improve your batting average. Um, and, and then I, I won't go into many of these. Uh, I will tell you in a group of rats, they had controls. Another group, they removed the adrenals. In the third group, they still had their adrenals, but they, and they gave them extra injections of glucocorticoids. And in the group in which the adrenals were removed, they had showed increased hippocampal volume uh, increased neurons in the hippocampus and increased connections uh, over the controls and, and in the controls that also were given extra glucocorticoids, they showed even more destruction of the hippocampus. Um, I, I love the study about salmon when they remove their adrenals. We won't go into that. Um, there's another that goes outside of the uh, adrenal cortex that talks about a test where they took mother's that were stressed with chronically ill or severely disabled children, and they were found to have shorter telomeres than their non-stressed peers. Uh, telomeres are, are things at the end of chromosomes, and, and, and they get shorter as you get older. We won't go into why right now, uh, but th these mothers had shorter, and it looks like they aged about 10 years more. Uh, so we're pretty much finished. I just gonna give you two summary slides. Uh, once again, uh, again, uh, again, priming, priming you that there's decreases in normal aging of episodic memory, processing speed, and executive functioning. And that what can we do about it? Physical activity, diet, cognitive training, especially taking a course, 
socialization and decreasing stress. And that is my last slide. So I have a list of questions here. Um, I, I'm, I'm not gonna read them all, of course, but they were divided to, for me into groups. And the first one I'm gonna go into is, uh, I, I'm gonna address the elephant in the room. Okay, and what's the elephant in the room? You, you know it, and it's called Prevagen, right? You all want to know, well, will that help? Okay. Well, first of all, some of you talked about the medicine Prevagen. Uh, Prevagen is not a medicine. It's a supplement which does not have the same sort of FDA uh, uh, supervision as a true medicine does. And uh, I, I don't feel that it is necessary. I don't feel it is helpful. Um, what I did was, uh, there, is a, there is a group called the Global Council on Brain Health, and this is a collaborative group that was put together, believe it or not, by AARP, and it's a group of academic leaders in geriatrics, in neurology, in uh, 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 neurobiology, uh, and uh, their statement was that dietary supplements do not improve brain health, and they recommended not to take these supplements. Um, one, of the, uh, one of the members of, of that group, uh, of the GCBH group, is, is a, uh, um, is, I was going to say a professor. He's a doctor that I, I uh, very, very much um, uh, enjoy uh, uh, listening to uh, and reading uh, his writings. His name is Dr. Ronald Peterson. He's the director of the Alzheimer's Disease Research Center, Research Center at the Mayo Clinic. And summarizing what he has said in specific is in general, most people do not need supplements. Sometimes there is a specific deficiency state, such as we talked about vitamin B12 deficiency, thiamine deficiency, and, and other things, folic acid, vitamin D. And um, he does recommend at that point to target those deficiencies. And interestingly, the amount of, 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 uh, the, the amount of uh, supplement you need there is, is greater than what you would get in a multivitamin. Uh, he states that good diets provide most of what's needed. And he also recommended, he said, if you want to improve your brain health, he recommended, not surprisingly, regular exercise, stay intellectually active and eat a Mediterranean-like diet. Um, also, the United States Preventative Services Task Force, which is very conservative, um, uh, they say, say that all the current evidence is insufficient to establish uh, a balance of the benefits and harms of a single or multivitamin uh, or, or any supplement to decrease uh, risks of cardiovascular disease or cancer risks and uh, uh, and as well as cognitive decline and even neurodegeneration such as Alzheimer's disease. So that's my statement regarding uh, Prevagen. And uh, of course, uh, there's lots of heavy advertising uh, for other supplements as well. Other questions that I got, well, are nuts uh, uh, still recommended for good brain health? I, I think I answered that. Um, uh, what about foods to avoid? We, we kind of uh, uh, talked about that as well. Highly processed carbohydrates, um, you know, sugary, a lot of sugar, things like that. Those are the things to avoid. Uh, another said, what about a glass of wine at dinner? That, that's a tricky one. And I will tell you, uh, if you remember one of the diets I mentioned was the MIND diet. They actually said that anywhere between one and seven glasses of wine a, a, a week. Uh, but that doesn't mean seven glasses of wine on Friday night. So no more than one a night of red wine uh, and no more than seven in a week was part of the MIND diet. As a physician, uh, we generally recommend that if you consume alcohol, that should be your goal. If you don't consume alcohol, don't start. So um, exercise and activity, I, I, I think we've pretty much answered those questions uh, in, in the talk. Particular kinds of exercise uh, was uh, someone asked. The answer, of course, is yes, uh, and that would be aerobic exercise. The other types of exercises are important. Stretching, toning, weightlifting, uh, those are important. But if we're talking about brain, uh, uh, improving uh, your brain uh, function, then it would be aerobic exercises. Uh, are video games helpful to your brain? Another question. 
most of them know um, uh, there are some. Oh, by the way, what are aerobic exercises? Um, treadmill, especially bicycling, elliptical, stair climbing, rowing, swimming. Uh, as a general rule, anything that moves your body from here to here or for stair climbing up, anything that moves your body or on a treadmill is supposed to move your body is pretty much considered an aerobic exercise. Questions about genetics and, and medical history. Well, is dementia ge a genetic related? The answer is very much for the most part it is. Um, uh, there are two things I'd like to talk about. One, there are mutations that occur. There are spe three in specific. One is the APP and then it's presenol one, presenol one, two. Don't worry about that in general if, if, you're, if you're a senior. Uh, these are genes that, uh, that are out there in certain communities. Uh, um, for, but these are people who'd start to develop Alzheimer's in their 40s and, and early 50s. Um, um, so most of you, that would not be an issue, but if there's a strong family history, it may be something you would want to check. Another is some of you have heard of the APOE, A-P-O-E genes, and these are genes, uh, and, and there are three uh, alleles, so there are three types. You can have uh, a type two, three, and a four. Four is the one that is uh, uh, linked to Alzheimer's. Um, about 25% of, uh, of, of uh, people have uh, APOE4, that's the bad one, and they probably have what we call an eight-year disadvantage. That means that they will, in general, develop Alzheimer's uh, about eight years sooner than they otherwise would have. If they have both of their chromosomes having APOE4, it's pretty bad because then it's double, so it's about 16 to 20 years earlier. Um, there aren't too many of those. About 2% of the population have both Apple E4s. Nevertheless, when you talk about genetics, you still can delay the onset. And again, we're not here to talk about Alzheimer's disease. You can delay the onset of Alzheimer's by doing a lot of the things that we already discussed, uh, you know, especially exercise and, and diet and, and brain training with, uh, with, uh, um, with uh, courses and, and intense intellectual uh, um, uh, intervention as opposed to taking a Prevagen or, or you, know, uh, you know, just doing one small thing or a brain game. Um, someone said, how common is it to lose your past, such as words, people, names, and events? That would be in the line of, of episodic memory. Um, one, one thing, there was a, there was a term uh, th there was a term that was uh, uh, given by William James, who's the uh, back about 130 years ago. He was the brother of Henry James, the author, and he's a he was a, a very very famous uh, scientist, doctor, psychiatrist, um, and he he developed the term presque vu. Uh, that's when there's a word, you know, kind of at the tip of your tongue, and I can't think of the word, and it's right there. And an hour later, boom, it pops into your mind. That's called presque vu. You have to remember that if it pops into your mind, that's okay. That's normal. If it pops into your mind later and you don't remember that you had forgotten it, that's more of a dementia problem. So if you're kind of remembering that you had forgotten that word before. You know, you give yourself oh, the dope slap, yeah, I remember that word, you know, uh, then that's that's kind of normal aging. And, and by the way, it happens to 20 year olds as well. Um, I, I'm gonna stop right here. Uh, I, we have very little time left. And uh, I, I think Sam, are there any other questions that uh, uh, people have that I can, uh, that they've written in that we can go to? Sure, we have a few unique ones. Um, one in particular is at what point should someone admit themselves to a memory care unit? Wow, uh, well, that's a question to a memory care unit. Uh, so are we talking about someone who is gonna enter, I'm not sure about the questions, are, are they gonna enter a sort of a group home? I'm not gonna call it a nursing home because uh, it, 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 and it's a little bit more than assisted living. Um, 
Um, so are you, to answer there, well, we're, we're really only talking about people who have dementia. Most of dementia would be about 65, 70% of dementia is Alzheimer's. Uh, th that's an individual question. We like to leave people in their own homes as long as possible and not really enter them into uh, one of those units. Uh, of course, sometimes, you know, that's necessary because of, you know, what the patients, what the persons, uh, uh, um, you know, are they living with family? Are they living by themselves? That that's a tough thing to answer. And then another one is what about sleep? How does sleep affect aging? Well, that, you know what, that's the, there are two elephants in the room when I started this. One is Prevagen and all the other things. I knew that was coming. Sleep is really, really, really tough. We, we know that good sleep is important for mental health. When people have certain sleep problems, uh, whether it's just primary insomnia, whether it's due to mental issues, whether it's due to bad habits, that seriously interferes with your mental activities. There are also other diseases besides primary insomnia. I, I think you all know about sleep apnea. Um, these do definitely decrease uh, decrease your, your memory and, and, and other mental functions. And, and these can definitely be reversed by getting the appropriate amount of sleep. This is a, th there's an entire specialty called uh, uh, sleep health. Um, there is uh, online, it, it's becoming more common now. There, 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 for people who have true insomnia that is not caused by keeping the TV on too long or bad habits, um, there are actually uh, uh, programs out there um, uh, 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 of ways in which you can improve your sleep, but sleep very, very, very much. That's kind of the elephant in the room when you're talking about a decline in mental activity. You, we have to eliminate that first. It's one of the most important things uh, in, in, in geriatrics is, is making sure that people are getting the proper amount of sleep or as, as good a sleep as we can get them. Thank you. Um, and then could you go over some like red flag behaviors that would make someone consider seeking an evaluation? Well, yes. Um, and, and it was kind of my hope in this talk to talk about things that are normal with aging. Um, and these are things and you can on your own decide that you know what, that sounds just like what Dr. Grumman said and, and you, know, you, know, you know, just cool it out and don't worry about it. But there, there certainly are flags. Now, if you get, if you're driving and we'll assume you're still driving and you're driving and you get to a red light and uh, I will tell you, for example, I drive down Howard Street and stop at Asbury to go home uh, several times a week and I might be you know, I might be uh, on a phone call with somebody, I might be listening to, to the Cubs game, I might get distracted, and then the light turns green and someone honks their horn behind me, and I look up and, oh my god, where am I? Oh, I, I'm at Asbury. Uh, what, uh, oh, yes, I have to turn left to get home or to get to the hospital or whatever. Um, that's not a red flag, okay? It's just a little bit of distraction. If, however, for example, someone gets lost in what is otherwise a familiar environment um, and, and they're, they're kind of frozen, that is one of those red flags. That, that would be an example. And I, I don't know, I hope you can see that one thing doesn't sound very pathologic, the other one does. So I'll, I'll tell, people will come in, a lot of people are obviously concerned that they'll say to me, oh, I had trouble, uh, I had one woman said to me, I, I was coming home from uh, out in the suburbs there, I was coming home from ABT uh, out uh, in Glenview and, and I, I got to the light and I didn't know which way to go. Uh, and I asked what she was doing in ABT and she was really concerned because her refrigerator broke and she was going to lose all of her frozen food and, and she was very, very distracted. I said, how long did it take before you were able to find where to go? She said, oh, it, it only took about 10 or 20 seconds and I made the, you know, she made the correct turn and that's just a matter of distraction. That's not a red flag. But if you're frozen there and you don't know where to go, what to do, that's an example of a red flag. That's pathological versus normal aging. Um, 
and, and that's kind of what I was hoping to do today is, is tell you what's normal. So if you have a lot of these, these minor issues in memory um, or, or things take you a little longer to do, uh, th these are not red flags. Thank you. Um, that brings us to the end of our presentation today. I wanna to thank everyone for attending. I hope you found the presentation informative and helpful. Please be on the lookout for the follow-up email that will include a recap and information on additional resources as well as a feedback survey. Thanks again, and we look forward to seeing you at the next Levy Longevity Series presented by Amita Health.